it ruins your flow. So just quickly answer the question and go back to your original topic. If you skip ahead and then try to go back, it's not going to work well. What if you lose your thought in mid-sentence, suddenly gone? Smile. <laughs> people like people who smile. It's the easiest way to cheat. Even if you do a terrible job, if you smile, people still like you. <laughs> do. And I tell students this is the easiest way to get the good feeling with the audience. Smile. I forget to do this sometimes, and I keep reminding myself, always smile. Because it creates the goodwill. And then if you smile and you make a mistake, everyone smiles, you laugh, you have a good time. But if you're not smiling and you make a mistake, it's like an earthquake. <laughs> no flexibility built into your talk. So by smiling, you create the good feeling that gives you much more flexibility for any problem that may come. What if you plan to go through your handout page by page, but people are jumping ahead? Well, this is why, oh by the way, I have a handout today. Remind me to give that to you. I brought one in Chinese, an outline of my talk today. I can give it to you after, yeah. If, this is why I don't give out the handout in advance. Because people will, will open it up and read it and ignore me for 30 minutes and then say, oh, I already know everything. Finish, finish. <laughs> it's really difficult. So this is the problem with giving out the handout first. I try to give it at the end. At the end is best, and then they can take it home and remember the key points. Uh, your throat dries out. This happens sometimes, too. Uh, one piece of advice that I've used and my students sometimes use is to put a little piece of tissue paper at the back of your last tooth and that will create saliva. Actors do that all the time. Try this at home first. <laughs> I don't want you to die in front of a lot of people. <laughs> but it, 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 it's one way to generate the saliva there. I drink lots of water. You see my little Charlie Wong bottle? I take that everywhere. And I fill it up with water and I drink and I drink and I drink because I teach a lot every day, so I need the water. Lots of water, you can just keep going. What if someone starts a private conversation while you are speaking? This can be so distracting, but at the same time, I think it's important to understand that when you are speaking, you are responsible for what happens in your room. You, are, you must be in control of that. You cannot allow a conversation over here to stop people from listening to your points. And this can be very stressful, I know, to deal with this, but the first thing is ask any questions, look at them, hopefully they'll stop. If not, you can kind of walk close to them and then get really quiet, and then they seem really loud, you know, and then they will, they will stop. Uh, notice your audience and respond to their needs. If the room is hot, turn on the air conditioning. If it's too bright, pull down the shade. You have to be aware of things that are taking your audience's attention away. I know one speaker who went into a room, it was too hot, this is at a conference, too hot, and the windows didn't open. So he took a stone and threw it through the window, <laughs> broke the window, and I think that's kind of crazy and extreme. But I admire that he's taking responsibility for the environment of the room. I mean, that, that shows that he cares, actually, about the audience. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> uh, also, you can distribute uh, copies of your paper at the end of your talk. We print out 25 copies of our paper, and we leave it there for people to take uh, when they leave. Uh, humor. Let's talk a little bit about humor. Do we have to be funny when we speak? The answer is no, we don't. Humor can be useful, certainly. It can help to get the audience's attention. It can help to make people enjoy themselves. It can help to make your point. But it's not necessary. And I think that this is important to understand for students who are always trying to be funny. Key point, if you're not funny, don't try to use humor. <laughs> it will be painful. Uh, I, I have a student who always begins every speech with a joke. And I always know it's a joke, which means it's not going to work. Whenever someone knows it's a joke, they won't laugh. It's about impossible. When you start, when you, whenever you say, let me tell you a joke, you just destroyed the joke. <laughs> it will never work. It will never work after that. Let me tell you a joke. And then his joke is always not related to his topic, which means it's high risk. He'll say, there's a man and a dog and a boat, and I say, oh. You know, there's no, going to be no connection there. So if the joke fails, it will be bad. So he always finishes the joke, and then he says, uh -huh. he, laughs. he 
he laughs himself, and we always don't laugh. And then he will try to explain why we must laugh. He will say, this is funny because you see that, that, and then it makes it much worse. And then he will say, here's another joke. Oh. Never use humor in the beginning of your speech. That's the most difficult time to use humor. You have no connection with your audience. If you're going to use humor, wait for the middle. Wait for the end. Never in the beginning. The audience doesn't know you well enough to know if it's okay to laugh or not. They don't know the relationship with you. So using humor, especially in the beginning, is very unlikely to work. And just remember that the most famous speeches in history used no humor at all. And we remember them to today. It's not necessary to be funny. Not at all. I don't have time today, but there are nine factors for capturing the attention of our audience. Humor is only one. Only one. And if we don't use it, we can still be great speakers, great presenters. And just remember, too, humor takes practice. If you want to use humor, especially for the different cultural environment, like a conference. You tell a joke that's really funny in Taiwan, and people in Korea will look at you very strangely. <laughs> it's a different culture. And it took me a long time to understand this in Taiwan. I remember when I first came, and I started teaching, that's nine years ago, in Jiao Da. I gave a... Uh, uh, story and uh, no one laughed. Everyone looked at me. I could hear small birds singing. <laughs> it was just a disaster. A disaster. And it's, humor is cultural. It is. And so you have to learn what works in this culture. If you don't know what works, just don't try. Or use humor that's related to your speech topic. I think that's always the best rule. Because then, even if it's not funny, it still works. It still adds value to your to your topic. Make sure it's connected. And whatever you do, don't wait for people to laugh. If you tell a joke and no one laughs, just keep talking. <laughs> when you wait, everyone knows that it was supposed to be funny. And do it. All right. I'm moving on here to using PowerPoint at the conferences. Don't uh, write everything on your PowerPoint and then just read it. PowerPoint is supposed to support the speaker, not you support the PowerPoint. PowerPoint can clarify ideas, emphasize key points, show relationships, like in a picture. That's a good function for PowerPoint. Uh, provide visual information to make sure the audience understands your message. Slides should be short. Six slides, six lines of text of slide is enough. Nine is a lot. Twelve is unreadable. That's just too much. Use a big type. Let me just show you some font sizes here. 72 point. Easy to read, right? 36, 24. 24 is the smallest that really we are comfortable with. When it gets down to 18 and 12, everyone's, you know, <laughs> squinting. And can't, you can't even read it. Uh, especially because the audience is already sure that the font is big enough. What kind of font should we use? We have two major types of font in English language. One is called serif, and one is called sans serif. Serif is an Arabic word, and it means feet. That's what serif means. Sans serif means no feet, literally, no feet. Now, when we say feet, if you look at the times, you see that feet on the bottom of the T, and on the end of the T here, at the bottom of the P, that's what we call a serif font. Serif font is 30% faster to read in a book, which is why most books are in serif font. However, when a serif font is projected on the screen, the feet become fuzzy. We don't like it. We like sans serif font for projecting in our PowerPoint. So a sans serif font is like Arial. That's a sans serif font. Here's one. Notice Helvicta, too. This is sans serif font. Notice that Helvicta is easier to read than Times. Also easier than Arial Narrow. Arial Narrow is sans serif, but it's, it's too narrow as well. So, for handouts and take-home material, use the serif font. For projecting on the screen, or using a projector of any kind, use the sans serif, the no font. <coughs> Choosing a color. They say that the most readable color is yellow and black, like a school bus. But that's a little bit crazy for our PowerPoint. So we like the contrast of white and black. Don't put red and green together, because 10% of people are colorblind and won't see anything on your screen. 
if you do that. Uh, if you use the white and black words, you'll be sure that people will be able to understand, even if you have light on your screen, although you should try to make sure that there's not light on your screen like today. This first row doesn't work, which is great. We can have dark here, light here. Often I go into classrooms and the lights are always this way, which means that there's no way to win, you know. Every, either everyone's in the dark or everyone's in the light. Don't put everyone in the dark. People sleep in the dark. <laughs> People sleep in the dark and in the warm. You want light and cold. Lots of light, very cold. That's the teacher's best friend. <laughs> always have the 8 o'clock class in Jiaodong. 8 o'clock in the morning, public speaking. Nobody wants to wake up at 8 o'clock, so we use all the weapons we can. <laughs> Students always come to class with heavy coat. <laughs> they know I turn on the air conditioning. Really cold. Make sure everyone is awake. <laughs> Let's talk about presenting with charts. <clears throat> we can use charts to show the relationship between things. And often students don't know which chart to use to best uh, show their results. The key point here is to start with your heading of your chart, which should have an action <coughs> word, a verb in there. The verb should show where we should look in your chart, what key information we should look for. Now, when you should take that verb, when you see the verb, then you can determine which chart to use. If your keyword has the word, if your uh, heading has the word grow, decline or trend, you should use the line chart. The line chart will show the change over time. So any of these key terms, this is the right chart for you to use. Easy to understand. If you want to compare items at one point, you know, tips for the graphs in your PowerPoint, only show one message. Today, I, I have a 2008, this computer has 2003. I couldn't use my 2008. Fortunately, I also had saved it as a 2003 because I was expecting this kind of thing to happen. It's very possible that this could happen to you. Save in those earlier versions of PowerPoint. If you're not using all the special features, the earlier version is good enough anyway uh, for you. Don't apologize for making errors. This is important. I oftentimes have a student who will make some error in his PowerPoint. English error, for example. And he will stop and he will notice and he will say, Oh, there's a mistake. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, my English is so poor. Oh. <laughs> Nobody even noticed it before. And now it became a really big deal. In fact, here's just a good general rule. Never say you're sorry. Never. When you're speaking. Ah, students come up a lot and they always want to be so humble. And they will say, I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm not really prepared. My English is poor. Please don't listen to me. Thank you. I'm just gonna... I wonder why you would kill yourself before you have a chance. But of course we will listen to nothing you say after that. We don't believe you because you don't believe you. Never say you're sorry for anything that happens in your presentation. Just keep going. Be as smooth as you can. Buy a wireless pointer and a mouse. I'm not selling these, but they're <laughs> this little thing right here. It only has the four buttons. I love it. I can go forward, forward, backward, or laser pointer, or blank screen. Only four buttons. I like this one particularly because the last one I had was like a, a TV remote control. <laughs> so complicated to use it. And I could just, simple is better. And this is cheap, super cheap. I love that too. And you can put a little pointer in the back, take it everywhere. And then if you get used to yours, then you can automatically change it without thinking. But if every time you go to a conference, you have to use theirs, who knows what kind of crazy device they have. It's better to carry your own with you that you're used to, and then you don't have to think about it when you're changing uh, your slides. Uh, the last thing about your PowerPoint, you should have a URL with your website address on there so that people can contact you later if they want to write a paper with you or if they want to work with you on a research project. Make sure you always have your contact info. If your paper is not online, put it online before the conference so people can look you up and keep in contact with you. Let me talk about handling Q&A for a few minutes. We've talked about that a little bit before. Students are always afraid about the Q&A part because we can't really prepare for it. 